Hello again. We'll give this a try. Test two. Can you hear me out there? Not in the control room. Sorry about that. Take two here on GRTV's live uh, Peace Day coverage. We're in the middle of about 24 hours of uh, celebration of peace programming. My name is Dirk Koning, and we've got an illustrious media panel, which I'll uh, introduce in just a Lustrous. second. Um, and uh, welcome to a live roundtable discussion of the responsibilities of media to the communities they serve. And it will be interesting, trust me. Um, I'll, about a half an hour into our discussion, we want to hear what you think about what we're saying up here. So we'll be opening up the phone lines roughly 7.30, 7.35. So as you hear us talking, if something doesn't make sense or you disagree or you do agree, write it down and be ready to uh, call the number you'll see on the screen in a little bit. I've got a few facts to kind of start us off and set the stage here. Um, the average American house has a television on seven and a half hours a day. Cable penetrates every other household nationwide now, which puts it in over 50% of the homes. Most towns have one newspaper. Um, the FCC has systematically cut away requirements for TV and radio to serve the public interest, convenience, and necessity. And one uh, crucial thing that just occurred, the FCC just abolished the 38-year-old Fairness Doctrine, uh, the doctrine that required radio and TV stations to cover, quote, controversial issues of public importance, unquote, within their communities and also to present contrasting views on those issues. Um, commenting on the FCC's actions this week, Ernest Hollings, a Democrat from South Carolina, Carolina, reiterated, quote, the American people own the airwaves, not the broadcasters. The threat today is that private interests, more motivated by profits than public interests, may limit public discourse, unquote. Within the past two years, uh, national companies have purchased our local ABC, NBC, and CBS affiliates, as well as our cable company. Our own Grand Rapids Press is owned by a monster corporation, Newshouse News, privately held media empire with 26 daily papers, Vogue House and Garden and the New Yorker magazines, cable TV companies, and Random House Books, worth uh, estimated $7 billion. So some of the questions we're wondering is, how interested in Grand Rapids in this community are these outstate mega corporations? And the first question, should media serve the community they're licensed in? And we're going to want to know what you have to say about that in a few minutes. And at this time, I'm going to introduce our guests, and we'll see what they have to say um, about those questions presented. First of all, on my left, we have Lynn Jarman Johnson, recently appointed um, Public Affairs Director, correct, at WOTV Channel 8. And to her left, John Douglas, should be recognizable to most folks, Grand Rapids um, columnist, as well as uh, film critic and media producer, as I understand. John Howell, going around the table here, uh, morning man, WGRD, uh, actor, trombone player. <laughs> actor? Uh, what? I've huh? seen some of your things. I'm trying to remember right now. And uh, <laughs> media producer as well. And then around the table this way, we have Ed Hoogterp, assistant metro editor for the Grand Rapids Press. So let me go back to the first question and, and see if there's anybody who wants to start out. Should media serve the community they're licensed in? Anybody? What Great. do you think? Where else? That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The easy answer is sure. But uh, then what is the community? I think we probably all have different definitions of that. Uh, how do you serve them? Who knows? It's not a, you know, sure we should, but no one would agree on how we do it. The real question is should a government agency of some stripe define how we serve the community that we're that we exist in. We're not licensed, of course. Um, some would prefer that we were. What do you think, John? Well, obviously it has to, it has to take the community's interest at heart, and it has to be able to respond to the community's needs. I, I, I don't like governmental regulation of the broadcast industry either, but at the same time, I am a real strong supporter in all public access, both radio and television. In other words, uh, you know, the, the broadcast industry is there with the many frequencies that are available in the AM, FM, band, and the other media outlets, all the television and cable channels, and, it, and it's there to make a profit as well as serve the community. I mean, that's obvious. Uh, but I think that uh, as we have here in Grand Rapids, and I guess you'd be able to tell me better than anybody, but is it true that every cable system has to have a public access channel or not? Not by law. It's an option within the city that so, franchises with it, but not guaranteed by law. We got this public access channel 
in order for the company GE to service Grand Rapids, right? It was part of the contract it's originally. Of deals, yeah. And it's been deals. renewed since then? Correct. But do you have a possibility of losing this someday? Any given day. <laughs> yeah. <it's laughs> See, that's where I think certainly. that that's where I think governmental regulations should at least guarantee public access on both television, which I think is the media of the future. And we also have uh, uh, public access, I mean, uh, public service shows on WGRD radio, both the AM and our sister station, and, uh, I mean, our, our FM, GRD, and our AM station, KTH, both have public service shows. And we make available that time to citizen groups or even individuals at times. That's up to our news director and station manager. Did I answer that question? Or that <laughs> I don't know. No, it sounded pretty good. What about public service coordinator? I mean, as a as a title or as a as a job, what kind of things do you? You have to look encourage? at television a little bit different, and the only reason is we focus on West Michigan. We don't f focus on a specific one community, as in just Grand Rapids. We are a West Michigan station. Uh, we're proud to be that, and. To do that, we have to have the community input, and that means community involvement from Kalamazoo, Muskegon, Battle Creek. Um, all of the station uh, is coordinated toward those goals, whether it be news, public affairs, promotion. And we specifically have time that is set aside for public affairs, which means the community involvement. And public affairs means that the public who doesn't have the option or who doesn't have the opportunity to get on the air otherwise can because we allow them to and help them do that. What shows do you have now? Right now we have our face-to-face -face program which is a half-hour show which runs Saturdays and Second Look also is a half-hour program and then also all of the PSA programs that we do. We also do six primetime specials a year that have to do with For Kids Sake which is a real big plus for uh, TVA. And we also have specifically um, set aside things like the big festival programs, our shows that um, deal with things like It's Your Night, which have to do with kids and prom and, and drinking and, and um, community involvement, which this year we did live not only in Grand Rapids but also in Kalamazoo. And what's the viewership of that kind of thing relative to, say, the Cosby, Cosby show <laughs> or Saturday Night Cartoons? <laughs> well. Well, let's see. The Cosby Show, as probably all of you know, is like number one rated. Um, we get plenty of phone calls when you cut into programming. For instance, if you cut into programming and do a local um, type program, you're always going to get the people who are kind of upset, who are upset that you're doing that. They're saying, wait a minute, my normal routine is stopped, and I don't like that. But when you get the letters that are saying, congratulations, thank you very much, um, I have never had so much, you know, input from my teenagers, from the person next door. Then, then it's all worthwhile, and it doesn't, you know, the negative out, you know, out far is is outweighed by the positive. Are you really serving the public, though? If you've got a program that, say, a hundred thousand people watch, and you put on a program that eighty people watch, definitely are you because still more serving than, the public. Are you? Are, yes. are you? <clears throat> And serving more than 80 people of, will watch it. Well, I'm just using those examples because you know that most of the time those specials don't don't pull the kind of ratings that mm -hmm. the shows do. So in, in essence, you're, you're not serving a, a large portion of the public who gets turned off by what you're doing. Well, you have to realize, too, though, that um, you've never really seen any television station. Most television stations will not uh, interrupt program, programming that is absolutely the number one uh, program of that night. That is very rarely done. Now they do, of course, follow it because you want to follow something that. Well, I guess has what I'm putting, I'm trying to get people don't give a hoot about those shows most of the time. I disagree. I think that definitely. I disagree also, very much so. And the only reason I do and, and can say so is by the uh, public that we've gotten, the response that we've gotten, not only from every type of show that we have ever done, the ones that we continue to do, um, small thirty-second public service announcements. We get phone calls on and, and questions and and. If one person, one person can be uh, moved enough to make a phone call or to write a letter and to say, hey, can I get more information and can I get help? One person, then yes, you serve the community. See, we, we always do those things too, but I'm, I'm recalling earlier this year we did a four-part series on juvenile crime in Grand Rapids. It was a expensive thing for us to do in terms of time and space in the paper and was very good, very well researched, very well written. Um, 
from that, we got probably 10% of the public reaction we got when our reviewer said something bad about Johnny Mathis. Yeah, I um, that. Yeah. So what, uh, you know, I, I think the point is that, yeah, we're going to do these public service things, but they're really very minor in what we really do and in the way we affect people because no matter, no matter what we do, the wire stories that we put on the front page, the Ann Landers and mm -hmm. Heloise columns that we run are going to affect more people than the things we do specifically for the good of the community. And in the case of television, the Cosby Show is going to affect more people. Saturday morning beat em up cartoons are going to affect more people than all of the documentaries and careful things that you do. Yeah, but is media supposed to reflect, you know, the, the, the McDonald's syndrome of America or is media supposed to try to enhance? You know, I mean Are we supposed to And you're talking to a guy who works for a rock and roll radio station, so it's not like I'm up on a, you know, it's not that I'm up on a high horse about it. But I mean, why why is network news really only like twenty two minutes long? And and your six PM news and ZZMs and Channel Threes and everybody's Although every, I am not a real, I hate five minutes of weather in my local news, but that's just me. Most people like it. But by 12 or 13 after six, you're done with your stories. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not a news director and I work in rock and roll radio, so I don't really have a lot of basis for this. But I wish you, you know, if, if forget about the public service programmings or the four page articles on juvenile crime, but why can't we get an hour's worth of local news? Certainly there must be an hour's worth of local news in this community, and at least an hour's worth of national did you ever, news. Did you ever go out and try to find it? <laughs> it's, it, it's very I mean, it has easy. to be there. Um, There's 500,000 people around here. We can easily fill an hour program, which we consider to be an hour program daily, five days a week, You guys used to have an hour, hour news, didn't they? We did local have news? an hour news, wow, but man. now we have what are two separate entities, which <laughs> the is the live at 5.30 and News 8 at 6. Um, but those two combined can bring in, you know, the difference between audiences is, is vast in those two because they're, you know, they're marketed different, they are different shows. But you can get the different type of news and you can di get the different type of entertainment that people in our community seem to enjoy in something like that. Um, it's really funny, but if you really would write down a script of a news script, um, can you guess how long one is? A Probably new script. 15 or 16, 17 seconds. 20 seconds is the is the the length that would be considered a nice long, you know, 20 second copy mm -hmm. story. Although you know, going back to the numbers game, which you mentioned, and John, you said something too. I mean, it, there's an inherent flaw, I think, in the idea, especially serving the community, that you've got to have the numbers. First of all, you've got disparate interests in the community. You've got all kinds of different cultural, and you just and you know, it's like taking a hint from corporate America, where they take you know, two or three percent, some companies up to five or six percent of revenue and devote it to something they know they're not going to get their dollar gain and their, you know, profit off of. And corporate America, America some companies have been real good at that and I'm kind of surprised in certain respects that media hasn't picked up on that and said, number one, if you don't put the time and money into the, into say, the, the television program or, or the article, you're never going to get the response. So it's hard to say it doesn't work if you really don't invest in it for starters. And the other, on the other hand, you can't just assume the numbers, you know, and this is where I think you see a major flaw, especially with a lot of television programming, is if the ratings aren't there, you're not going to see it again. And there's got to be some point, especially with a lot of different, you know, channels available and if there were more newspapers available, that you go after smaller markets, similar to what radio did when television came into being. People said radio is going to die. Instead, it went into very, very tight tightly formatted markets yeah, see, we don't, serve small interests. We don't broadcast anymore, we narrow cast. Everybody finds their niche, <laughs> like live at 5.30 or, or WGRD, we play top 40 or contemporary hit radio. The paper is about the only medium that goes that far across a wide spectrum, but then again, you know, paper doesn't have the impact. Well, cable, okay, cable does. Disagree with that. Cable does. Uh, cable goes across, which I think is the beauty of cable television. Mm -hmm. is it takes a little load off of their shoulders. Definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, some of the cable channels can do some of the things that they were doing and not getting an audience for. Um, you can do on your channel, for instance, um, and the, like the city commission thing that you do, which I think is terrific. Uh, yes. Nobody else could do that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't print the entire thing in the paper. She couldn't run the entire thing, but you can, and uh, and you do, and I think that's tremendous. And I think that's the kind of, that's the public service. Yeah, and I guess my point would be that that's certainly a public service, 
Um, it's certainly a good thing for those people who will watch it. It's wonderful that it's available. Um, I, I think that probably if we added up the money all of our institutions spend on public service things, we'd find that it's a heck of a lot more than we normally think. But what I'm saying is that that's, you know, a few shovels of dirt in the face of a rising ocean of culture. There's not much that we can do about uh, the way our teenagers react to rock and roll. The way, you know, I mean, it turned my mind to Jello 20 years ago, and now you're doing it to my kids, right? Uh, oh, no, wait a minute. Uh, but. Uh, the, uh, all these things that we do are very small, and I think in a lot of ways, we've got to the point where, because the media are so omnipresent, we think that the media created culture. And so people blame us for all these weird things that we report. I don't think we do. I don't think that, that we're responsible for having created the, the breakdown of neighborhoods and the crime wave and uh, the fact that, that our government uh, seems to believe that you know, sending soldiers all over the place is a, the right way to conduct foreign policy. Uh, but somehow that's all wrapped up into, a, into the news media doing these things and reflecting these things. Um, and we're really not. We're just looking for good stories, doing our job the same as everybody else. And sometimes taking a little time out to say, this is an important community thing. Let's do something about it. And the horrible thing is that when we do that, we make as, people, as many people mad as we please because every, everyone, each one of us defines the community as me and the people who agree with me. So that if we, uh, if we go out and uh, do a nice public service on uh, raising money to aid our freedom fighters in Central America, we're going to make somebody mad if we go out and raise money to uh, aid the Sandinistas against the vicious Contras, we're going to make somebody mad. Going to be run out of town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, did but, that yeah, but you see my point that uh, on, on anything like that, even, even to trying to raise money to uh, improve the riverbanks, some people say, well, that's stupid. Why are you spending all that money downtown when there are neighborhoods falling apart all over the city? So you try to serve the community, but it's still a question of just what is the community to be served. Uh, every time you do one thing, every time you put a dollar here, you're taking a dollar away from here. And I, too much people rely on the media to do things they ought to be doing themselves, I guess is the, the final point. Well, I think it's okay that the government, with this fairness doctrine and, and with the deregulation of all television and radio. I mean, it used to be that you had to provide a certain uh, percentage of, of your hours of programming to public service. And that really mucked, in the eyes of programmers and in the minds of programmers, it really mucked up a lot of stuff. Because we'd rather just throw rock and roll around the clock. We have Sunday morning public service programs, but they're on Sunday morning. You know, they're not on Friday afternoon. And, and you know, the same with TV. And really the same way with the paper, too. You still have your front page stories. You still have your columns. You're not going to take Pete DeMake's space and put in a public service, although he is a yeah. public service yeah. paper. Yeah. But, uh, but now with the advent of public access television, uh, deregulated radio, I think as long as we ensure the survival of those mediums, I don't mind deregulating the commercial mm -hmm. media because I think it'll be covered. And I think as long as people have access to it, it's their choice. And as long as it's able to get printed as far as in the TV listings and things like that, so it's not buried. When you take television news, for instance, and people are so worried about the fact that you're going to, if you take away the fairness doctrine, then you're going to take away both sides of the issue. Well, that's just not true, because if a reporter is doing their job, okay, if the news is doing their job, they're going to get both sides of the issue, because that is what yeah. the story is for. That is what the public is going to be told, okay? That's as far as news goes. Now, as far as when you're getting into public service, um, I definitely don't think that there should be any specifics that says you have to do this and you have to do this. But any station or any newspaper that doesn't want to help out the community isn't going to go anywhere in that community. It's just not going to happen. No one will pay any attention. Everybody's just going to turn them off. 
That there's still, a, I think there could still be a flaw there, and, and as far as the deregulation, suppose I did want to respond to something I saw, whether I thought a reporter was biased or I thought uh, that half the story was missed one way or another. How, and this gets back to, uh, what do you think about the airwaves being public? I mean, what if I wanted to gain access? I know public access can do part of it, but I mean, our budget here in an entire year is about Rick and Suzanne's salary. <laughs> That's what six of us work here and all the stuff you see and all volunteers here tonight, thank you folks. I mean, they're not making a dime and we're not really gonna fill the gap. I don't, I, I think that's a misnomer. We don't have the money, the equipment, and the time. What if I want to get on the public airways? As a citizen, yeah, my airways are flying around up there. What if I want to get access to the public airways? How do I do it? I walk into Channel 8 and say, I want to talk on Channel 8. What is your concern? I want to respond to an article or to a story I saw Cliff Caldwell do or Henry Herb on such and such and such and such. Okay, if you <laughs> have an, an, a concern that needs to be published, that isn't just a off-the-wall call that someone makes that, that does happen. Um, but if you have an honest concern that needs to be published, that all of a sudden people are saying, hey, this really should be, then that's going to turn into a story itself. Oh, no, not always. Oh, no, I didn't say always, <laughs> yeah. but mostly if they're not, if they're honest concerns, then they will. No. Uh, they will. No, she's, too she's, too she's right, you see, that, the, uh, that those, <laughs> those who are articulate, powerful, or merely... Uh, have enough gall to, to walk into the TV station or the newspaper and say, this is a story. Those people have the power to, to make themselves heard, and they will make themselves heard. The problem is that the vast majority of people are, are not powerful, are not at least brave or articulate enough to walk in, and so they're not heard, and they're not heard under the Fairness Doctrine, and they won't be heard without the Fairness Doctrine. Mm -hmm. Which brings us back to the point of access is really the only thing you can do for people like that. We can say at the newspaper, we maintain a letter to the editor page, which is better read than anything I ever write, though not better read than what John writes, because we put him next to it. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, and say, you know, if you're mad at us, write us a letter. And when you write, well, how many letters do you guys get a day, generally, or you know, after a, a major controversial story? What do you it, get, a hundred or fifty it, it, or no. ten or what? It, it varies, but it not varies. Uh, on a controversial issue. Um, usually, we won't get a lot of letters. Now it depends an ongoing thing, Iran Contra. I bet by the time that's over, we'll probably have gotten fifty or hundred letters. Uh, probably we run, I would say, anywhere from four to six a day six days a week so do you realize um, too that when one person actually writes a letter that means there's got to be five ten fifteen people back there saying they would have written the letter in radio we know. use a one to one hundred uh, ratio if one person complains and chances are you offended a hundred people 99 of them didn't write yeah yeah but well, i wish more that, people would write i think yeah, that yeah. you know there are days when they're they're scratching for letters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and more days when they're scratching for good hard letters yeah. uh, everybody gets a kick out of a really good well, why don't you put why don't you put letters to the editor editor on the front page then I mean certainly people would be more more uh, you know they'd be more or page three or something yeah, they'd be quicker to write to letters I don't I don't think I don't think, think, that think, I don't think they would be in the uh, might even be less yeah if they the readership the surveys page. show that uh, they're very well read mm -hmm. and a lot of people read the front page and then go to the editorial page and I, I go to the think, editorial page first in the press. Um, there you go. Yeah. If we put them on the front page. <laughs> yeah, you, <laughs> of course, you would comics, still, comics are still the best read page, is that true? Or is that survey a little dated now? I think probably the front page is the best read. I mean, you have to read it to pick it up, there. right? Um, but, all, but all those things are, are very well read. And I think that despite years and years of efforts, the... Uh, lifestyle sections, ours is the flair section, still tend to be read more by women than men. The sports section still tends to be read more by men than by women. And we try like heck to kill those stereotypes. The advertisers know them. And they say, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, if I'm, if I'm selling jewelry, I don't want it in the sports section. Mm -hmm. I want it in the flair section. Um, and the advertisers, by and large, want their stuff in the front section. They, you know, their feeling is that somewhere in the front section they'll be read. Percentage-wise. And yeah, and I think that I think that you know, 
if you look at what our medium is, most people pick up a newspaper to find out the news of the day. You know, um, where did we bomb today? Where was the latest tragedy? How many more AIDS deaths? Uh, whatever, and they look through the front section. And then once they're in the paper, once they've picked it up anyway, they'll take a look at John Douglas and the latest feature we've written and the letters to the editor. John Douglas the all the time. Yeah. Uh, Would yeah, the, the a certain kind of person does. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, usually because I like to see if I agree or disagree, and then I, read it, right. I, then I read it in the morning and to say if I agree or disagree. Check it out. Yeah. Do you think the Grand Rapids Press, uh, how would they be better, or what would you do differently if we had another powerhouse paper here in town? I mean, the competition issue always comes up about where the press might either be lazy or, or arrogant in, in choices or decisions because there ain't my, nobody my, else. My guess is that you'd see less substance, considerably more flash, and considerably less public service for the reasons we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, if, we're, if we're in a race with somebody for the almighty dollar, yeah, how can we waste half of our front page every day from Thanksgiving to Christmas on the Santa Claus girls? You know, we got to get Madonna out there. Well, except if you um, look at the Detroit newspapers, they both have different points of view editorially. On the editorial page, well, sure. Well, also in their, their stories on the front page, I think it's a real healthy competition. I wish there were two newspapers or, an, or a morning paper here, it, a small uh, morning paper. I think in a, in a lot of ways, as a journalist, I'd like to see that too. But, uh, but I think the free press is exactly what you're talking about, though. Oh, I yeah. think the free oh, press... Yeah has become that kind of paper yeah. mm -hmm. that you, I, I, that you I were think talking that, about. I think that uh, the idea that competition between huge corporations um, builds the kind of creativity and, and fun and competition and fighting to beat each other for this good story and fighting to serve the community better, that's a myth. I mean, that's a myth. If, you know, if, we, if we were in a situation where Mike Lloyd owned the Grand Rapids Press, and uh, Dan Spaulding owned the Grand Rapids Herald, and they were fighting between each other for community acceptance and all that kind of thing. Maybe, maybe then you'd have that that kind of competition that we'd like. Yeah, but, but that's not the way it is now. It would be Gannett Corp against <laughs> Newhouse. USA Today revisited. Well, it, well, it would, and what yeah, you'd see well, is. Well, I don't. Is, I don't I know, think what's so. The options? It's, it's like dangerous. I don't think I don't, so. I think that yeah. you would. You. If there were another paper, it just says if, if there's other radio stations and other television stations, you automatically have the friendly competition. And sometimes it isn't very friendly. Should but you friendly. automatically get the competition that, com that, that comes with that. You know, um, when, when you see the lead story on, on Channel 8, you're automatically, anyway, I do, mm -hmm. flip around to see who else had yeah. the lead story. But that's only because, you know, I, I work there. But that's the I'll fun part of it, and that's the part that... that you really get you know get you going and get you out there out the door and, sometimes. And you're absolutely right on the level of an individual journalist mm -hmm. fighting to do her job and to you know make herself a better journalist and to beat the competition. There's no question that it makes it more fun. But in terms of serving the community, the first thing you do is you you know you lop off a couple million bucks in revenue. Um, now, you know, you could argue that some of that money goes to the corporation anyway, but some of it does go back into things like fireworks and, um, you know, pu public service things like the Santa Claus Girls. Or just reporters. Mm -hmm. or, or just reporters. Um, so you might, what I suspect you'd see, honestly, is a, is a newspaper that was probably more fun to read, um, brighter, easier to handle, but with considerably less substance because you don't make money off substance. You don't make money off making space available to do something thoughtful on Nicaragua or AIDS or juvenile crime. You make money on, uh, you know, what, I suppose catching the mayor with his fingers in the cookie jar. So is that still supposed to Oh really? <laughs> Tell us about is that. that a breaking story? Yeah, I want to hear about that. No, I mean, who's if I do, I'd make some money. <laughs> but is that conditioning of the American public, or is that just what people want to hear? I mean, more people eat at McDonald's than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. We got great restaurants in this town, mm -hmm. but people still go to McDonald's, and and mm -hmm. uh, people still watch primetime TV. Oh man, primetime mm -hmm. TV. You want to get me rolling on something? I hate <laughs> primetime TV. I search out local programming. I really do. And, uh, and you know, listen, and with a paper, and we listen to junk on the radio instead of going home and putting a tape in. Yeah, well, but but <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> far and away, <laughs> above all that. But but uh, 
I think that yeah. it's conditioning. I wish that we had. You know, I wish that. I don't believe in governmental regulation, but it seems to me that we'd be able to include harder, harder stories, harder features, especially in TV news. I think, and mm -hmm. I think if you look around the Grand Rapids Press, there's good stories, and there's there's stories there that you know move the community. You just have to find them. And uh, radio, I mean, you know. We have our public service programs. Why can't talk radio survive in Grand Rapids? They've tried it three or four times here. Mm -hmm. I mean, why can't talk radio survive or news radio? I still believe. I think the people in America they don't want content. But I got you go to the uh -oh. movies. There's no content. You watch television, primetime television. There's no content. You buy USA Today. There's no content. That's what they want. You go to the McDonald's. You go to Holiday Inn, no surprises at Holiday Inn. Maybe that's what everybody wants, no yeah, surprises. I no surprises. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big point, hassle-free life. Eh? You, um, yeah, but it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy to be like that. I don't it's think, though, that... It's crazy I don't to think dish that, it up, too. I don't think that everything is like that all the time. I mean, there's always going to be the time when... Um, and, of course, you can go on and on and on about how people just love the easy life now, you know. But... There's programming on today that people watch and love, you know, very hard news, very hard hitting programming, very hard hitting newspaper articles and hard, you know, radio type programming. And it's around and there are people who are getting it and there are people who are loving it. Then you've got to realize, okay, the mass audience doesn't. So do you ignore it? No, you can't. Fit it in somewhere. You know, now since we are going to have one paper in this town, I mean, obviously the way it goes, I. Oh, well, the Grand Rapids the, Times is here. I mean, pardon I me, I know. Times. There are, pardon <laughs> me, there are other papers. Yeah, and advance the, the advance is coming on. Yeah, it's it. But uh, like with the Grand Rapids Press, I asked Mike Lloyd one time in an interview like this, uh, why doesn't the press have an om ombudsman, somebody who can, you know, have a column in and clear and free? And he brought your name up as well. John's kind of like an ombudsman, and I wondered if you've ever considered yourself that. Well, or, if that means do I take the press? to task for things. I do on occasion. Do you think it'd be good to have a person in a position, you know, maybe in that stature where they could handle concerns of people coming well, in? Well, I'll be frank with you. I think that's what the, and to a degree, that's what the public pulse is. Uh, a lot of that, a lot of those letters are knocking the press on the, on the chops for one thing or another. Um, and I do it on occasion. But uh, I don't know um, if there's any advantage to that or not. I, have to, I don't know. Um, as long as the community seems to be doing it fairly consistently, and they are. Yeah, but that's only based on what they get the day before. Mm -hmm. In other words, the community, they respond to what they see in the press or watch on TV or hear on the radio. You know, they're not necessarily just unsolicited sending in their opinions on important issues of the day. Some I mean, more, like you said, more people <laughs> wrote in because Marie Having is her name, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, wrote that Johnny Mathis was but lethargic or you know <laughs> sick or whatever. You know, more people wrote in. That was I couldn't believe it. Well, Johnny you, Mathis. You can, you can do a story on uh, somebody getting killed or somebody being killed. You get nothing. Somebody kills a dog. Yeah, yeah. it will be swamped. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, I can give an example. Uh, working in the news, which I did previously before I became public affairs director, and it was a weekend and it was a Saturday and we did a story about. A house fire. House fire, you know, you go to the scene and you see that the house is demolished and you put it on the air. And, and um, we went one step further just by saying um, the Red Cross had, has offered to help out this family because they, they don't have a place to go. Mother and four kids. And about 7 o'clock the phone rings and I'm real busy and everybody's real busy. And I pick up the phone and then the woman said her name, which sounded familiar but I didn't ring a bell. I couldn't remember where I placed it. And she says, uh, I'm such and such, the owner of the house. And like I about fell off my chair. What you know? What's she doing? I thought, oh no, what you know? She says, I want you to know that I've received 50 cans of food. People have already offered to have me stay at their house tonight, and thank you very much. Okay, but how come we don't do it every day? Don't have enough house we, fires. We don't yeah. have enough house fires. No, but let's start the something. Point. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. The thing that makes What's that work. News? The thing that makes that work is that it's different, and you have these appealing little things that that happen, and that. That's a good example because it's a fairly common sort of thing that, you know, we've had, you know, the uh, little boy gets his wagon stolen and yeah. tomorrow he's got seven red wagons <laughs> in front of his house. 
Uh, or a wheelchair. But, or but if we, you know, if we start, you know, doing a, a wagon of the week yeah. or something, people will get tired of it. But you never really know what things are going to catch people's fancy, and sometimes they do. Say from the public, you know, groups out there, nonprofit groups, and I think this applies to most everybody here, how do you, in a position of deciding who to produce a PSA for, or you're sitting there and uh, editing one day and you get two or three potential stories about neighborhoods or something, how do you prioritize um, what's going to make it? I mean, is it strictly the numbers game? Has it got to appeal to enough people? Or what, what uh, and maybe as advice for, for groups out there that are trying to get coverage or trying to get their public uh, re, you know, press releases read and, and a story done on them, what, how do you prioritize it? For television, um, in my position already, I receive phone calls probably five to ten a day asking, you know, they would like to have something on the air, whether it's something that they produce themselves or something that, please, you know, can you help us produce something? That is my entire job. That's what that's what I'm there for. So um, as far as prioritizing it, it isn't, it isn't if, probably they would get more airtime if there was more people involved, if it will help a great majority. I, you know, I don't, I, and I don't mean more airtime like as in an hour, I'm talking about a 20 second, 30 second, 50 mm -hmm. second, 10 second kind of thing. Yeah, but you don't say yes to everybody, right? I mean, those five or 10 a day, you can't be saying yes to. I, um, I always say, yes, I'll try. I never say no. But that doesn't mean they get on. But I will okay. put it toward date book or put it toward PSA bulletin board, put it towards the news. But you never, you know, you, you can't say no. That's not what your job is. Good to hear. That's my job. <laughs> uh, no, a no man. We have, uh, we have a lot of places for, for small community items that we have probably a dozen community calendars for culture, for senior citizens, for, you know, trips, for neighborhood things, for church activities. Plus we have Pete DeMag, who is uh, basically that kind of a column. But when it comes down to, are we going to write a story about your group, how do we decide who we're going to write about? And I, I guess that comes down to your question. Um, it's partly just a seat of the pants opinion. You say, is this interesting? Are people going to be interested in this? Um, if you say, yeah, it's kind of interesting, then you say, well, when's the last time that we did something about this group? There's a tendency for the same people to come back time after time after time after time and want you to continue doing them. And at some point, we'll say, no, we did you last week. Um, there's also the question, you know, is this, is this group on the up and up? Are they, really, um, are they really a group that's going to do what they say they're going to do? Have they been around for a while? Are they a real community-based group? Or are they a couple people who are trying to use the media, trying to use us to build interest in whatever they're interested in so that they can have a group or an agency or some money? Uh, so you go through all that stuff. And as far as advice, the... Uh, all, all the obvious things are the right things. You, know, you pick up the phone and you call the press and you say, I want to talk to Ed Hooterp. And when Ed Hooterp gets on the line, you say, hey, jerk, you know, <laughs> do this story. This I and I say, no. <laughs> he says no, no and yeah. you never say no. no. So most, but most you see, I work with nonprofit yeah. organizations. Yeah. So, so do we. And I would say that over the course of a year, it's a very rare that a community group could say, we tried to get things in the press and we're never able to get anything. See, so on today I'll, I might say no. If you ask five times, I'll probably say no three times. But your stuff will get in. And that's the real key is when you got something going on, you call the radio and you call the TV and you call the press and you get somebody interested. And then it shows up on TV and my boss says, Ed, why didn't we have this? <laughs> You know, it, huh? yeah. you know, it's one thing about that too, is, uh, it's been my experience from writing some of that stuff also, is that there needs to be some business or something out there to help people prepare the material, mm -hmm. I suspect, for television or, or newspaper or, or wherever they want it to go. Uh, we'll get things that don't tell you where it's going to happen or what time or what day. Uh, the things as important as that just left out. And, uh, you know, a lot of people could use some help in that along that line because if, if we get something that's incomplete mm -hmm. I would think on any given day how, how very busy you are that's oh geez this is you're not going to track it down we, right? we don't have time to track it down now yeah. and uh, 
I, I write what I call flack stuff for the entertainment every once in a while, and I'm amazed at how many phone calls I have to make to people who want information, but they don't have the pertinent information. And, and, yeah. Uh, so those people need a lot of help out there. Who, what, where, when, why? Right. Just try to get the yeah. basic tenants. And, in there. and their phone numbers, we can call them up. That's you have right. to realize that the stack of mail that we get every day, and I'm sure mm -hmm. you do too. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's big. Make it easy on you. With that. Why don't we, speaking of numbers, Robert? Why don't you go ahead and put a number up there? We're coming down, and uh, anybody out there that uh, has something to say, feel free to give us a call, and uh, somebody will take your name and give a listen to your question, and then they'll pipe it through to us out here, and, and we'll give a listen and try to follow up with it. On radio, we have a uh, two Sunday morning programs that are produced our half hour each. They're locally produced each week by our news director, Jennifer Stevens, and that is open. You have to. You have to. Um, call her and she decides whether she wants to do it or not, but generally she does. Generally she's hungry for stories. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also maintain a public file, which is whatever, whenever you write a letter, especially a negative letter, in regards to programming or even community issues, they're in a public file, which doesn't mean anything because it's just there. It's not, it's not exposed at all. But you can uh, look at the public file. Every radio station has to mm -hmm. have one of those, or at least they did up until the day before yesterday. Now that the FCC has dropped the fairness doctrine, that's going to change things around a little bit too. You know, it already has. I mean, you know, it's yeah. been deregulated. That, even that sort of thing, that's all included in the, in the fairness doctrine. So yeah. what, what is included? I'll, we always think of it as that crazy equal time thing yeah. where you let, give the Republican 20 seconds, you've got to give the Democrat, the Communist, the Socialist labor. But what are the other things in there that are well, out yeah, the some of the, I'm not a legal counsel, but I know that we've always, we've always had to maintain a public file and give people access to the airways. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is going to change somewhat where it is more of an option. Yeah, just, and it, it was so vague, it was things like just covering issues of public importance, um, and then of course the equal time that we mentioned with the, uh, with the fairness. Mm -hmm. What about, um, and this again goes back with, with the numbers game, what about what's happened in media with kids? And the idea, especially here's, here's where I think deregulation's got to do something, because I, I, I've got a, a young son who's starting to watch Saturday morning junk. And these are, these are just 30 minute commercials um, that you call whatever you want to call them and it's just strictly for products that are on the market and they animate them for 30 minutes and sell them. I mean the, the kids aren't going to be a market for, I mean the kids particularly, so they're not going to be covered that way and the FCC dropped rules pertaining to, to children's programming and requirements. I mean what's going to happen there and where's the responsibility and is there a responsibility? There's definitely a responsibility for children. You know, they're our future. And um, that we at TV8 have for kids' sake. We just picked it up for year two. It's been, honestly, you know, I know everybody's going to say, oh, well, that's a great profit thing. But I'll tell you, we have never had more positive response from the community than we have since we started for kids' sake. Um, specifically, talking about, you know, the cartoons and, and things like that. I, I particularly, <laughs> this is just my own opinion. But it bothered me when they started editing Bugs Bunny and, <laughs> and they, you know, those were the good old cartoons. You know, I think the government is partly responsible for that pablum that you're talking about. I think the government is, is responsible for Care Bears and My Little Pony and all their garbage uh, because all of a sudden you couldn't do anything on TV for That's the right. kids except the have kids. things move around. Uh, no emotion, no, no, no nothing. And some of the, you know, the cartoons are, have some nice themes and some, you know, things, but some of the stuff I've been watching too, I agree. I Except that's nothing new, you guys. I mean, if you go into the, what's that, that hot dog place in East Town, and they have all the old cartoons up on the wall, if you look at those cartoons, they're from the 30s and 40s in the Grand Rapids Press, and, uh, you know, at the bottom of the panel, the Sunday cartoon, the big cartoon itself where you can order, you know, the, the cartoon character you just read and saw about. I mean, there's nothing new to that. Everybody's marketed through media. I mean, that's... Well, that, does, that doesn't bother me either, as long as the program's good. I, I don't care if they mm -hmm. sell uh, yeah, the dolls. But, I mean, but it's a, uh, as long as the program itself is good. And it but is. then again, we're back to the fact. More kids That's watch right. the Care Bears than they'll ever watch yeah. Captain Kangaroo. Why? But some of the Care Bears, though, and the um, specifically like Smurfs and things, at least can put a message on the air in some <laughs> respects. You know, they'll put the messages that, that the, you know, the Snow White and Seven Dwarfs kind of thing, you know. And um, you'll get that through there. It's the ones with um, specific... I Nothing like to step on a Smurf. I'm sorry. Oh, no, they're so cute. Uh, I like them. I like 
put one in a cage or something. Like that. Somebody sure. already beat us. You could have it for pets, you know. How are we doing on phones in there? Four five nine four seven eight eight. Don't be shy out there. Give us a jingle and uh, ask us anything you'd like to, closely related to what we're talking about. Moderately related to what we're Moderately. talking about. Yeah, Moderately. you know, John started to make a point that about how things have been like this. I mean, things aren't really that much worse today than they were before, and that's something we should remember that with all the media problems we have today and with all the legitimate and not so legitimate complaints that people have about the Grand Rapids press or TV or radio, uh, it would be hard to make a case to show that uh, we're, we're less fair and less public-minded today than we were 20 years ago or earlier than that. Um, we're, and we're probably better. We're, maybe we haven't progressed as fast as we should have, but uh, we did a couple of weeks ago a uh, kind of a reprieve to look back at the Grand Rapids riot of 20 years ago and the uh, to read what we wrote in the Grand Rapids press in 1967 about a race riot you know a fairly relative to what happened in Detroit and other big cities of a minor race riot uh, it's a real eye-opener that at that our, our news stories spoke of mobs Mm -hmm. being confronted with marvelous police work uh, and the you know the implication and sometimes outright statements of that of that time were that uh, one group and this is right one group and this is wrong uh, we've come a long ways maybe we haven't come far enough I think we've got a but call let's we're a lot different excuse me than second. go ahead and if you can give us a ooh deadly feedback uh, hello. Go ahead. Yes, um, I was I was wondering about violence in cartoons. What did you have to say about that? Okay, we touched on it a little bit. Anybody uh, respond? Violence in cartoons. I think violence on anything is something that doesn't it, um, need to be shown. What about Wile E. Coyote? In the road. See, run. that's the problem. You know, I, I, okay. let's I mean, just like I said, when that was edited, violent. it yeah, really surprised yeah. me. Yeah. Because I never, as a child, didn't consider that violent. If I'm going to watch it, I don't care. I mean, if, if I'm watching the cartoon, and there are cartoons for adults, I, I assume we're talking I would cartoons imagine. for yeah. kids. Yeah. Uh, I think Warner Brothers, in the days they put out the Bugs Bunny, knew that a lot of their audience were adults in the theater, mm -hmm. and so those, those are more adult cartoons. Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily find it offensive because it has violence in it. Uh, I like the Bugs Bunny cartoons, yeah. uh, frankly. But it depends on what kind of violence you're seeing. You know, there's different uh, levels of violence and graphicness that you can show. And when uh, there's a difference between seeing Wile E. Coyote jump off a cliff or fall off a cliff and then you don't see anything except a bush, you know, and then seeing an arm off of someone whether it's animated or not, and mm. blood gushing all over. It's a completely different form of violence. And, and yeah, I think that violence on TV is fine. I would like to see more stuff from South Africa. I just don't like, I'm just sick of watching Hunter. That's right. Or, you know, uh, uh, Miami Vice violence. I don't give a rat's ass right. about that. I'd like to see, you know, I want to, if there's violence in society, which there is, and I think it should be reflected in media. And that, Definitely. you know, you said, yeah, but you just said, I don't think that violence should be shown at all. No, no, no. Well, okay, yeah, but that's not what I meant. When it okay. comes to news, okay, and I mean news. So I think there should be more news. And I specifically think that, that that's. But you do have, you have limits there also. Definitely. You, you don't, show. well, every, you know, you have limits that you don't, you know, specifically show some forms of, uh, graphic display on television, our news director will be called in to look at the video. And that's, you know, important to do. It just seems so watered down, all of it, you know? Every me every every form of media. It just seems watered down. Blood and guts. You know, no, no I don't. You know, it's just that it's just that everybody's struggling for a level of mediocrity at times, you know, just so that we don't rock the boat. I mean I'm talking radio community too. You know, I mean your radio can get real mundane at times. You know, we have our public service programs, and in the mornings, occasionally, we try to raise issues. You know, we had the guy in Holland with three dogs. We thought that was ridiculous. We raised a ruckus about that. He got released story. the next day, you know? The uh, sheriff, we told people to call the sheriff up at home. Um, but, but that's still fluff. Basically, that's just entertainment for morning radio. We don't talk about abortion in the morning. We don't talk about 
you know, the the South African situation on rock and roll radio. And, you know, everything has its own place. I just wish there was more places. I wish there was bigger and better public access. I wish your budget was at least double of Susie's, <laughs> you know, you know uh, yeah. salary. It really infuriates me that that in in the day and age of the, the most channels and the most access to issues, that it seems to me that we just keep getting watered down. I mean, look at primetime TV. And, you, and, the, and those shows keep failing. How many times has Roger Mudd tried to have a show in the last five years? Or that West 52nd Street or West 57th, whatever that is? Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good show. I watch that. Yeah, and I suspect, that's being canceled. I suspect your channel is only going to be on as long as the cost of a channel is down. Once, once that channel becomes really valuable, this channel, well, the it's going to be there. gone. The yeah. pressure is there. It'll be gone. And, and mm -hmm. there'll be a ratings game on cable just like there is on network television. They'll dump the lowest rated show, yeah. Arts Entertainment, will bite the dust one of these days. Um, your channel will bite the dust. I did a thing in the paper the other in a news release the other day for an all football channel available now for, <laughs> for uh, they just run all football. Well, see the other the other option is to go the way of radio with uh, with searching for a specific demographic yeah. rather than for a you know, for a huge you know the greatest Cross number of people. Yeah. Um, and we're stuck you know t talking about uh, watered down. It's fairly common around the press that we'll have either a very good story or a very good picture that the photographers will say, this has impact. Yeah. This shows uh, something that? about about drunk driving or traffic. That story you did on the, the photographer who had been there many years, I saw it the last Sunday, the gentleman that did the story on the, the uh, man who lived under the highway bridge. Yeah. That's yeah. good stuff. Yeah. Why is it, you know? It's well, there's only, there's only so much of that. But what I was saying is pic pictures like that, it always comes up the question, are we going to offend people? Are we going to hurt more than we help? Are people going to understand what the message is from this man, you know, that, that we're not putting a man down, mm -hmm. we're trying to tell a story. And that always comes up and sometimes we disagree with each other and uh, things that half of us feel ought to be in the paper and that it's our responsibility sometimes to Sometimes the best video is if a plane crashes, not the shots of the bodies coming out of the plane, not the shots of the body bags, but the shots of the little shoe dangling from the tree, or the shots of, you know, absolutely nothing that shows. I know that, but that's true. Those things, and not walking up to someone and saying, how do you feel about this? It's the pictures that tell it without the, you know, you don't have to show. I know, I know. It's violence. just, I don't know, it just uh, it seems to be, and it's real frustrating to me, you know, to have 12 minutes of local news. And that's not your fault either. I mean, you know, sometimes we get 16. Wow. <laughs> How many people we got here? 500,000? I mean, there has got to be more happening. You know? Oh, definitely. We feel, you know, we definitely feel, can fill a show that way. You know, as far as that goes, there might be more happening, but who's to say that John doesn't want to watch the weather? So do you cut down the weather to two minutes instead of three minutes and 30 seconds? Do you cut down sports? Heaven to forbid you pull Wheel of Fortune. That's yeah. right. Let's do a poll it's there. I said cut the weather down. Me to too. 30 <laughs> seconds. Yeah. I, say, yeah. I say bring old Craig James on to the top of the hour. He goes, sunny tomorrow, high of 85. Comes back at 15, yeah. sunny tomorrow, high of 85. And at the bottom, <laughs> sunny tomorrow, high of What is all this weather, weather, weather? You know? People love weather. I know. And in radio, People too, I'm told that I have to mention weather. weather every three and a half, and it, four minutes. And it says something about our community that there are very few recognizable media stars, but Craig James, the well, weather What is the deal? Everyone's going to have to do the, the same thing star. no matter what the weather is. I have to go to work yeah, with this rain right. shine. Uh -huh. yeah. you know, there's very well, few yeah, but you still would chair. like to know if you need you can, your umbrella. Yeah, yeah, but you can, sometimes you don't but who, find out. But. You don't have to tell me I need my umbrella or tell me what Just it is like in Iowa. You know, or, well, look, at this is coming across the Rockies. It's going here in six days. Great. Thanks. I like the man. I know, and my dad loves it too. If you talk to my dad, he loves that. Well, it's just, you know, that, that goes back to what we were talking about before. The USA Today has a whole page of that junk. Yeah. I think yeah. color graphics colors. and graphics. I love colors. the satellite shots. I got <laughs> that's right. The time lapse and you see the Yeah, that's just because you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're just like that technical <laughs> stuff. Beautiful. Beautiful. I get up and I just go do something. If I catch Warren, 
or the sports thing, great. If I don't, I'll come back and see if I can't see what Freeman's doing. But that's how my news thing goes. I watch I'm the hard news. I'm glad you know us. You I know, watch, you know our personalities. I watch the news stories till 12 after. I get up. I go make dinner or something. So that's your VCR you know, well, and the other channel. Isn't that so funny now? Because a lot of people or... sit through the news so they yeah. can get to the weather. It's just like the editorial. It should go through the front page. I know on radio, too. I'm told that you know, if I want to pick out a serious issue from the Grand Rapids Press, sometimes out of the front page of your metro section or something's happened, you know, or something serious happened, I, I, I'll prepare what I want to say. I'll highlight the parts of the article I want to talk about on morning radio. I'll solicit phone calls about it, and I'll get off the air, and I'll get reamed for it because, you know, it took away from a Madonna record. Yeah. Well, you see, that's, that's why we're not running things here at the table. <laughs> and, if, and if you really want, uh, yes. if you really want to see what people care about, put the wrong lottery number on the front. That's right. Oh, or on the television set, or don't gotcha. read them up long. I had enough. a lady That's call right. up who was going to sue us because we had the wrong three-digit number. She thought she won. She went out and spent her winnings. Oh. Oh. Saw the correction the next day. <laughs> hey, that's the thing. That's a, here's a point. It happened to me once when I was a kid. When I, I grew up in Holland, and I went to the state park. And I was, I was interested in this woman who was staying there, this girl who was staying there uh, in the campground. And I stayed after 10 p.m. and I got caught and I got a ticket for trespassing because I was in the park after 10 without uh, having, uh, being registered to be a camper. So the Holland Sentinel uh, put me in a big column of, uh, it said, uh, teenagers with alcohol violations at the Holland State Park. Just Photo? listed me. Oh, no, no, just listed me, like with a hundred other kids, you know. Well, all my teachers and my folks and everybody saw that, and I hadn't gotten a ticket for that at all. So I called up the editor, and I can't remember the guy's name. And I think this is back when they were still locally owned, maybe. I can't remember. But uh, so, so I said, you got to, you know, I, wanna, I want a correction. I want a correction. And this guy's mad that I called him up already, and he said, all right, all right, what's your name, blah, 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 he took all that. Hung up, and about two days later, another article came out and said, Same. Area teenagers caught for trespassing violations. And then I was in there, and that was the correction. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, thanks, guys. How are the people? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, they're wrapping us up here on uh, that note, and uh, I want to thank you all for coming down. And uh, I think part of this me, uh, to you folks out there is be active. If you've got something to say, call. Ed may say no. Lynn may say yes. John, <laughs> you never know. And if you got a good joke, <laughs> give them a call in the morning. And, and keep public access television alive. All right. Thanks, That's John. Great. We appreciate really. it. We'll be here doing it. Stay tuned. We've got uh, 20, uh, 12 more hours from here of uh, peace celebration programming here on GRTV. Stay tuned for more of it. Thanks.